Good morning. morning. A little light in here today. Somebody must have gotten a hold of the speaking schedule. Uh, (laughs) Not, I guess, you, Mr. Peterson. I'm talking about myself. Uh, (laughs) I saw you look right up at me. Uh, the announcement uh, that Mr. Hayfley referenced was uh, Jim Cribbs uh, case sent an update yesterday. Jim is doing much better. The headaches are gone. Um, he still looks like he's been hit by a truck, <laughs> but uh, he is healing, and he's very grateful for the prayers and the cards and the calls. Uh, Kay did real well with her chemo this week. She's on the every other week cycle now, so um, she sounds real strong and looks real good. So, But please keep them in your prayers. Uh, you know, it's a trying time, and um, Jim just needs to stop being such a climber, then he'll get off of ladders, you know. <laughs> what is he doing on ladders? I don't know. So, and then I was thinking about that whole logo thing, and I thought, well, I got a box of crayons. Why not, right? $100, I get a whole new box of crayons. Make the logo. So I think uh, we can all agree that the scriptures are filled with some of the most remarkable stories in all of literature, with lessons for us to contemplate. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, now these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the age have come. And truly for us, the ends of the age seem closer every day as we watch the news. To begin with today, I'd like to turn to one of these remarkable stories in the Old Testament. One that falls into my bucket, if you've heard me speak before, I have this bucket of things that make me say, huh, how did this ever happen? And it's found in Exodus 32. If you'd like to turn there, we'll take a look at this story that makes you scratch your head and wonder, how did this happen and happen so fast? Verse uh, 1 of Exodus 32, and I'm going to go through this story and skip through some of the verses, but uh, I think to take the context of this, we need to really take it all in. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long from coming down from the mountain, this is probably 37, 38 days, I don't know, somewhere, because we know he was up there for 40 days, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Aaron answered them, oi, Take off your golden earrings from your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took them, and he, uh, he, he took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioned it with a tool. So he worked over it a little bit. And then said, the, then they said, the people said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he was appalled. No, he wasn't. He built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a feast to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early, sacrificed burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and to drink and got up and indulged in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. And they they began quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made for themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. And they have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And now drop down to verse 10. And God says to Moses, now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, and then I will make a great nation from you. And verse 11, Moses sought the favor of of the Lord his God, and he said, Lord, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, with great power and might? So they're kind of going back and forth of uh, who these people, who has a responsibility for these people. And then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. That's in verse 14. I'm sorry, I dropped down to verse 14. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back, and the tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. 
And when Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is the sound of war in the camp. And Moses replied, it's not the sound of victory and it's not the sound of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. And when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and burned it in, fire, in the fire and then ground it into powder and scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. And he said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them in such great sin? And Aaron answers, do not be angry, my Lord. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods that will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who, who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know. We don't know what happened to him. So I told them, but whoever has any gold, bring it and jewelry and take it off. And then they gave, it, they gave him the gold, gave me the gold. And I threw it into the fire and poof, out comes this calf. Down to verse 30. The next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sins. But if not, then blot me out of the book that you have written. And the Lord answered Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sins. And the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. We read this story and we say to ourselves, that's incredible. How could they possibly go so quickly from the miracles God had performed to them to return to pagan worship. When, when we contemplate this story, we naturally have to ask ourselves that question over and over again. How could they so quickly fall backwards after all God had done? After all, they had seen their, the enemy that oppressed them, Egypt, destroyed. They had crossed through a sea on dry land. They saw God bring water out of a stone. They had heard the voice of God from the top of the mountain. And further, and more interesting, how could Aaron seemingly go along allowing the, and participating in such foolishness? Aaron did not just have to throw the, Aaron did not just throw the gold into the fire and poof, out came a calf. He participated at a certain level with these people. And this, all of this happens in somewhere between 30 and 40 days while Moses is up on the mountain. In a, in a way, we must be careful of the very same thing. Each year we come home from the Feast of Tabernacles and the festival of the eighth day full of this kind of spiritual energy. We imagine that the Israelites would have had after they had come through all of those miracles with God's help. Yet as soon as we get home, we find ourselves let down, that the, the way that they felt in Moses' absence. And as soon as we get home from the feast, we are faced with our own golden calves of our, of our own Egypt. The worldly holiday seasons come at us very quickly at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, which if we are not careful to avoid as much as we possibly can, we may find ourselves not so much like those throwing their gold to Aaron to make the calf, but may find ourselves more like Aaron, who severely compromised what he knew what was right, not standing out or fighting the pool of the people, or in our case, the pool and the allure of the worldly holidays or the pagan holy days that are just before us. There is a parallel here for us to consider when we see Moses' reaction. We have just completed the annual holy days. In our own way, we have come down from the mountain fully aglow of God's presence. And what we are faced with when we return? Pagan worship of a modern kind, which has its origins all the way back to that golden calf and beyond. Today, I'd like to take the time to review with you the truth of the origins of the pagan holy days or the holidays that we are about to face. As we face the first of five 
that will come on us before the spring holy day, Halloween, which is just three days away. I thought it would be a good time for us to review this form of worship to remind ourselves of their true origin and meanings, and more importantly, how our Father in heaven sees these days. While this sermon will be a review for many that have been in the church for a long time, and will have a considerable amount of historical context so we can understand how these days developed and how they were taken over by Christianity in context, it is important for us periodically to remind ourselves of their origins, to reset into our minds where they came from and what they actually represent and how God sees them, and from whom they come, so we never approach them as Aaron did with the Israelites when he lowered his shields and formed for them a golden calf and an altar and actually instructed them to have a festival in front of it. In front of it. While he may not have directly participated, he got involved, and we must not do the same. So it is that I would like to show today the connectivity of all of these holidays, beginning with Halloween and ending with Easter, and their origins, and you'll see that they have the same author that goes all the way through them. For several of these, I just went to the historychannel.com to get the origins. And they are interesting, as I said, and you'll see a lot of commonality in here. The first one is three days away, Halloween. Halloween today is a secular holiday. You don't really think of it as a religious holiday, but yet it has religious origins. And we'll read through that, and I'll show you the progression of how it has come to be what it is today so that we know we have to stay away from this holiday, all these holidays, because of their origins. Historychannel.com said Halloween... Uh, or the Halloween's origins date back to the ancient Celt Celtic festival of Sowin. Sowin is actually spelled Samhain, S-A-M-H-A-I-N, but it's pronounced Sowin. The Celts who lived 2,000 years ago in the area that is now Ireland, the United Kingdom, and northern France celebrated their New Year's uh, celebration was November 1st. This day marked the end of summer and the harvest and the beginning of the dark, cold winter, a time of year that was often associated with human death. The Celts believed that on the night before the new year, the boundary between the worlds of the living and the dead became blurred. And on the night of October 31st, they celebrated so in, when it was believed that the ghosts of the dead returned to earth kind of reminds you of the original lie of Satan, surely you won't die. They're celebrating these people that have de died. In addition to causing trouble and damaging crops, these previously dead people, the Celts thought that the presence of the otherworldly spirits made it easy for the Druids or the Celtic priest to make predictions about the future. To commemorate the event, the Druids built huge sacred bonfires where the people gathered to burn crops and animals as sacrifices to the Celtic deities. During the celebration, the Celts wore costumes, typically co consisting of animal heads and skins, and attempted to tell each other's fortunes. By 43 AD, the Roman Empire had conquered the majority of the Celtic territories and in the course of the 400 years that they had ruled those lands, two festivals of Roman origin were combined with the traditional Celtic celebration of Sowin. The first was Fernalia, a day in October when the Romans traditionally commemorated the passing of the dead. The second to honor Pomona, the Roman goddess of fruit and trees. The symbol, interestingly enough, of Pomona is the apple, an, incorpor an incorporation of this celebration into Soen, the History Channel says, probably explains the tradition of bobbing for apples that is practiced today on Halloween. I don't know if people still do that, uh, but when I was a kid, they certainly did. We did it at school, actually. Then comes the Catholic Church when they adopt uh, this practice. On May 13th in 609 AD, Pope Benefit IV dedicated the Pantheon in Rome to honor all Christian martyrs. Now, the Pantheon existed as a building. It was a pagan temple, but it's the only one actually in Rome that the church didn't tear down. They kept it. And he made it uh, a 
uh, dedicated it to Christian martyrs on the 13th of May in 609. And the Catholic feast of All Martyrs Day was established in the Western Church. Pope Gregory III later expanded the festival to include all saints and all martyrs and moved the observance from the th May 13th to guess when? November 1st. The ninth century, uh, by the ninth century, the influence of Christianity had spread into all the Celtic lands where it gradually blended with and supplanted other Celtic rites. In 1000 AD, the church would make November 1st All Souls Day a day to honor the dead. It is widely believed today, this is the History Channel saying this, it's widely believed today that the church was attempting to replace the Celtic festivals, these pagan worship of the dead with related church sanctioned holidays, synchronism. And we'll see that through all of these. All Souls Day was celebrated similarly to Soen. Big bonfires, parades, dressing up in costumes, this time as saints, angels, and devils. Sound familiar? All, the All Saints Day celebration also was uh, also called All Hallows and All Hollow Mass. And the night before it, the traditional night of Soin in the Celtic religion began to be called All Hallows Eve and eventually Halloween. The celebration of this holiday in America is rather interesting and I'll just touch on it for a minute. Celebration of Halloween is ex was extremely limited in colonial New England because of the rigid Protestant belief system there. Halloween was much more common in Maryland and the southern states. And that makes perfect sense because those were the Catholic states. Maryland was created as a Catholic colony for Catholics uh, trying to get out of England and Bloody Mary. It wasn't until the second half of the 19th century that when America was flooded with new immigrants, Unfortunately, my ancestors, the, the millions of Irish fleeing the potato famine that helped popularize the celebration of Halloween nationally. There is so much more. You, that's a lot, and I had to edit that. There's so much more. But I think you can see the synchronism of ancient pagan rituals with, if you will, Christ, the Christian faith, which is, has nothing to do with Christ. Turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 19. Now this scripture is not really about, was not about the holidays and that the like. It is about Jesus Christ compared to the world. But the, the end part, the description of the world in which he came into is so much worse yet today. And it says, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. These days that we'll look at today in God's eyes are evil, but men love them because they love darkness rather than light. And then let's go to Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah 35 and verse 15. God is, expresses his frustration it says, I've sent, you, I've sent to you all my ser servants and prophets, rising up early and sending to you, them to you, saying, turn now everyone from his evil ways. That includes all of these pagan rituals. Amend your doing and do not go after other gods to serve them. Then you will dwell in the land which I give you and your fathers. What does it say next, though? But you have not inclined your ear nor obeyed me. If we're involved in any way with any of these days, that is what God is saying to us. And Aaron did the same, but you have not inclined your ear, nor obeyed me. We, say, we see the same disregard for God when it comes as we move forward to the next holiday, Christmas or Christ Mass, the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ in Christianity. We know from the scriptures that we can prove using the eighth course of the Levites in 1 Chronicles 24, that is the course of Abijah, and we couple it with the foretelling of Christ's birth of, to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, that Christ, we can calculate that Christ was born somewhere between the very late part of August and the very early part of October, just depending on uh, the full length of Mary's uh, gestation. So 
we know that it was not in December in any way. So how did this, how do we get to this false golden calf, this teaching and this false worship? How did this happen? How did this become part of our world? Well, again, from the History Channel, they explain what happened. It says, in the middle of the winter, the middle of the winter, that is, has long been a time of celebration around the world. Centuries before the arrival of the man called Jesus, early Europeans celebrated light and birth in, in the darkest days of winter. Many people rejoiced during this winter solstice when the worst of winter was behind them and they could look forward to longer days and extended hours of sunlight. In Scandinavia, the Norse celebrated a pagan festival called Yule on December 21st, the winter solstice. Through, and they carried that all the way through January. In recognition of the return of the sun, fathers, the, the sun in the sky, fathers and sons would bring home large logs and they would set them on fire and the people would feast until the log burned out, which could take as many as 12 days. The Norse believed that each spark from the fire represented a new pig or calf that would be born during the coming year. At the end of December, the end of December was a perfect time for this celebration in most of the areas of Europe. At that time of year, most of the cattle were slaughtered so they, could not, they would not have to be fed during the long winter. For many, it was the only time of year when they had a supply of fresh meat. In addition, most wine and beer made during the year was finely fermented and ready for drinking. In Germany, another part of Europe, people honored the, the pagan god Odin during the midwinter holiday. Germans were terrified of Odin as they believed that he made nocturnal flights through the sky to observe his people and then decided who would prosper and who would perish. Because of his presence, Many German people chose never to go outside all winter. In Rome, it was even worse. In Rome, where winters were not as harsh as those in the farther north, Saturnalia, a holiday to honor the god Saturn, and the, the god of agriculture was celebrated. Beginning in the week leading into the winter solstice and continuing for a full month, Saturnalia was a hedonistic time when food and drink were plentiful and Norman, normal Roman society or social order was turned upside down. For a month, slaves became masters and peasants were in command of the city. Businesses and schools were closed so that everyone could enjoy the fun. In the fourth century, the Catholic Church officials decided to institute the birth of Jesus as a holiday. Unfortunately, the Bible does not mention, this is the History Channel, does not mention the date of his birth a fact that Pur Puritans later pointed out in order to deny the legitimacy of Christmas and the celebration. Pope Julius I chose December 25th. It is commonly believed that the church chose this date in an effort to absorb and adopt the traditions of the pagan Saturnalia festival. First called the Feast of Nativity, the custom spread to Egypt by 432 and to England by the end of the sixth century. By the end of the 8th century, the celebration of Christmas had spread all the way to Scandinavia. By holding Christmas at the same time as the winter solstice festivals, church leaders increased the chances of Christmas, that Christmas would be popularly embraced, but gave up the ability to dictate how it would be celebrated. By the Middle Ages, Christianity had, for the most part, replaced all pagan worship, on, at least in Europe. On Christmas, believers, it was celebrated totally different than the way you would recognize it today. And New York City actually historically gets their police department because of the Christmas riots. On Christmas, believers attended church, then celebrated in a drunken carnival-like atmosphere similar to Mardi Gras. Each year, beggars or students would be crowned the Lord of Misrule, and eager celebrants would play their part of play the part of the sub of his subjects. The poor would go from house to house to the, of the rich and demand their best food and drink. Its owner, if its owners failed to comply, the visitors would most likely terrorize them with mischief. Christmas became a time of year when the upper classes would repay their real or imagined debt to society by entertaining less fortunate citizens. 
It was in the early 17th century that a wave of religious reform changed the way Christmas was celebrated in Europe. When Oliver Cromwell and his Puritan forces took over England in 1645, they vowed to rid England of all decadence, and as part of their effort, they canceled Christmas. There was no Christmas celebrated in England. I think it was for 60 years. Uh, and by popular demand, after Cromwell dies, the English people go get Charles II from France, and they bring him back, restore him to his throne, and with him came the popular holiday of Christmas. It is speculated that maybe uh, England would not have brought back the royal family if they had not canceled Christmas. It was very upsetting when you read the details from the people. The pilgrims in, in America, the English separatists that came to America in 1620, were even more orthodox in their Puritan beliefs than Cromwell. As a result, Christmas was not a holiday in early America. In fact, from 1659 to 1681, the celebration of Christmas was actually outlawed in, in Boston. It was against the law. There's much, much more you could speak about as Christmas and its customs and its origins, which go all the way back to the sun god Nimrod and the Christmas tree representing himself resurrected as his son Tammuz. While modern history, as we saw, we can foot back through history, history, documented history, some of that very ancient history, such as the relationship of Nimrod and the ancient pagan worships, cannot be proved without a doubt because we just don't have that kind of historical documentation. But it is clear to me without a doubt that it does go all the way back, and these habits and these traits go all the way back in history. And what does God say about our relationship with such pagan worship? I mean, they've changed it to make it about God. What does he say? What does he tell us to do about such things? Leviticus 18, Leviticus 18, verses 1 through 3. 18, verse 1. Leviticus 18, in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the children of, speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God, you must not do as as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. There is a message for us. We've all come out of our own Egypt, a type of Egypt. We must not do as they do with Christmas and Christmas parties at work and anything that gets anywhere near these holidays. We must stay away from them. God goes on to say, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. And again, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 30, Deuteronomy, verse, Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 30, we're warned to take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed before you, that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I will also, I will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their God, their gods. For they, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you to, to do, observe it, and you shall not add or take away from it. God has given us his holy days. He's given us the plan. He's given us his Holy Spirit to understand it. This celebration has nothing to do with the birth of Christ, which we're not commanded to observe either. It's an abomination to God. Christmas, all of its pretty lights, all of its nice music, all of its attributes are an abomination to God. The next holiday we come along, I'm not going to go into the superstitions, is New Year's Day, which follows Christmas, but it is replete as well with the celebration of pagan worship. And then we get to one of the worst, one of the worst, the second of the, well, I don't know if you can name them, one's better or worse than the other, but Valentine's Day, which happens in February, because it's made out to be love, and it's made out to be something that it is not. And today you would not know that it was even a church holiday because churches don't celebrate it the way they once did. But that, it, they, they did adapt it, and we'll take a look at that. It says, while some believe that Valentine's Day is a celebration 
is celebrated in the middle of February to commemorate the anniversary of Valentine's death or burial, and it is interesting to read about him. He may have been a member of the Church of God. Uh, it's not clear, but he is sacrificed in, in the Colosseum to lions. And when you read about how now some 200 years later they adapt it, it's, it's, I can't really, you can't really tell, but it makes you wonder when you read about Valentine. He would, if it's true, he would be appalled. And his burial, which probably occurred at around AD 270, Others claim that the Christian church may have decided to place Valentine's Day in the middle of February in an effort to Christianize the pagan uh, celebration of Lupercalia. The celebration celebrated at the Ides of February, the 15th of the month. Lupercalia is a fertility fest, uh, festival dedicated to Faunus, the Roman god of agriculture as well as the Roman founders, Romulus and Remus. To begin the festival, the members of the Luperci, an order of Roman priests, would gather at a sacred cave where the infants, Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, were believed to be cared for by a she-wolf or a lupa. The priest would sacrifice a goat for fertility and a dog for pur purification. Then they would strip the goat's hide off into strips and dip it into sacrificial blood and take to the streets, gently slapping both women and crop fields with the goat's hide. Far from being fearful, Roman women welcomed the touch of the hides because it was believed it made them more fertile in the coming year. Later in the day, according to legend, I don't think they can support this, all the young women in the city would place their names in a big urn, and the city bachelors would each choose a name and become paired with that young woman for the year ahead. They go on to say these matches often ended in marriage. <laughs> I don't know how they know that. Uh, Lupercalia survived the initial rise of Christianity, but was eventually outlawed as it was deemed unchristian. At the end of the fifth century, Pope Galatius declared February 14th Valentine's Day, and it was not until much later, however, that the day was, became definitely associated with love. It was during the Middle Ages, it was commonly believed in France and England, that February 14th was the beginning of the bird's mating season, which added to the idea that the middle of Valentine's Day should be a day of romance. So they've created, they go from this Lupercalia and they create it in the name of this martyr, or this man that was killed, Valentine, in the Colosseum. Is, how does God feel about this kind of behavior and this kind of lustful love? Turn with me to Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25, while this is not a celebration of Lupercalia, it has similar overtones. Numbers chapter 25 and verse 1. While, the Israel's, while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women, who invited them to their sacrifices to, to their God. The people ate the sacrificial meals and bowed down before these gods. So, the Israel, so Israel yoked themselves to Baal Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. Celebrating these days or having anything to do with them would be the same. It would be as if we were yoking ourselves to Baal Peor, because that is what these days represent, pagan worship. Verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, take the leaders of these people, kill them, and expose, their, expose them in broad daylight before the Lord. Lay their bodies out so they swell in the sun before me. They disgust me. So that, the Lord's, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses uh, said to the uh, Israelites' judges, each of you must put to death those, who, th those of your people who have yoked themselves to Baal Peor. Is love important to God? Absolutely. Did God command or approve such festivals which point back to this very same behavior we just read in Numbers 25? Absolutely not. We must stay away from these holidays. Just look at the anger God had here when he said, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before me. 
or what he told Moses concerning the golden calf. When the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sins. God hates these festivals, and as such, we must keep our distance from them. All these festivals have the same origin, the same creator, which is why it is so important to look at them collectively as we are today so we can see that distinct thread that sews them all together. What makes this worse, uh, what makes the next one worst of all of them is that it goes so far as to mock and, and, and diminish the, the greatest act God has had with his son Jesus Christ for all of us the life of his son sacrificed for our sins. And Easter takes and mocks that. I took some of this from a split sermon I believe Mike Willie did a number of years ago. Uh, he did a really nice job on this subject, so I took some of his notes from that and some other historical reading I've done. But so, since Easter did not come from the Bible, the question is where did it originate? Vine's expository tells us that the term Easter is not even of Christian origin. It is another form of the name Astarte, one of the titles of the Chaldean goddesses, the Queen of Heaven. The Nelson's Bible Dictionary tells us that Easter was originally a pagan festival honoring Yoster, a Germanic goddess of light and spring. At the time of the vernal equinox, sacrifices were offered to her in her honor. Even to this day, the equinox is one of the holiest days in the year for the pagan religions, and that would include the Catholic Church. They, they celebrate the equinox, or they, they, mat, they manage the time for Easter from the equinox. Fertility goddesses have, have been around since time immemorial. Only the names have changed slightly. They, they have been called Ishtar, uh, Astarte, Astarith, Esther, and of course, the most familiar of all, Aphrodite. All these are considered virtually the same goddess due to the similarity in their names, their festivals, and their mythology. In fact, when it comes to the mythology, it's amazing how similar they are. They vary only slightly between the cultures, but basically, they have the very same theme. The Babylonian mythology goes like this. Ishtar, the goddess of fertility that supposedly brings forth all life on the earth, is married to Tammuz. I think it's kind of interesting. She's married to a god who has the name of Nimrod's son. Tammuz dies while hunting wild boar. Ishtar is so grief-stricken that she follows him into the underworld, a land of no return. In her absence, the earth is deprived of fertility. Crops won't grow. Animals won't mate. Life is in danger of coming to an end. With Ishtar gone, winter now dominates the world. The superior god A, which is spelled capital E, lowercase a, and is a god of wisdom, is moved by the grief of Ishtar, feels for Tammuz, and gives her a special potion, which she sprinkles on Tammuz and gives him the power to return to the light of the earth, but only for six months. For the other six months, she has to return to the underworld where Ishtar naturally follows him and winter sets in for another six months. From the Phoenicians and the Syrians, we get Adon and Astarte. From the Greeks, we get Adonis and Aphrodite. The stories are basically the same. The only thing that changes is their names. The spring was a time of great celebration for the pagan religions. They held spring festivals in honor of their gods, lit bonfires, chanted and danced, and made sacrifices as they celebrated the triumph of spring over winter. The New Catholic Encyclopedia confesses that most Easter traditions originated from ancient rites connected to the spring and fertility and are all relics of the pagan past. You'll get little argument that the day itself has pagan roots, but what about some of the bizarre customs that are associated with it? The most recognizable of those would have to be Easter eggs, the brightly colored eggs that people put out on Easter. The egg was a sacred symbol among the Babylonians. They believed an egg of wondrous size fell from the heavens into the Euphrates River. And from this marvelous egg, the god Astarte, or Easter, was hatched. And so the egg became associated with her. 
The Encyclopedia Britannica says the concept of eggs as a symbol of fertility and renewed life goes all the way back to ancient Egypt and the Persians, who also had the custom of coloring and eating eggs during the spring festivals. The Easter bunny, as it is called, would have to be the next most uh, uh, recognizable symbol. But actually, it was a hare, not a rabbit. And some of the pagan cultures associated the hare with the moon, giving it special reverence during the spring equinox. The story is that the hare was once a bird that Yoster, that's the goddess Yoster, changed into a four-footed creature, once again making it closely associated with her and the symbol of fertility for obvious reasons of the reproductive rights of a hare. And so how about for early Christian? How did the Christian community move from Passover, as we see in the book of Acts and through the, the, through the end of the first century, how did they move from that to the pagan celebration of Easter? It's not abundantly clear uh, exactly when it happened. It's not like the others were a pope dictated and said on this date, this is what we're going to do. It seems to have happened in the second century when the curtain drops and John dies and Timothy is on place. Somewhere in the second century, this seems to happen. From an article I read on abcradio.com, uh, I'll give you the details, which are very common to a number of other articles I read on how Easter became associated with Christianity. Following the advent of Christianity, they say the Easter period became associated with the resurrection of Christ. In the first couple centuries after Jesus' life, feast days in the new Christian church were attended or attached to old pagan festivals. This is from a professor, Cusack. He goes on to say, spring festivals with, uh, with a theme of new life and relief from the cold winter became connected explicitly to Jesus having conquered death and being resurrected after his crucifixion. What we do know is that in 325 AD, the first church council, the Council of Nicaea, determined that Easter should fall on the Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox. So when the curtain rises in 325, we know Easter exists. You also know if you do an, enough study on it that there was a big argument even about Easter at the time. By the time you get to about 400, Passover is no longer recognized within the Christian community. It's interesting to consider that almost immediately in the second century, Satan moved heretics to take away the most meaningful symbol that God has left us, Passover, the taking of the bread and the wine, the humbling of ourselves, washing the feet of others, and replaced them with Easter bunnies and colored eggs. 2 Corinthians 6, chapter 14. Second Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Paul was speaking about unbelievers and the culture in the world he was in, or the, at least the, Corinth, the church in Corinth was in, but it became so much more true 100 years later. And, so, and down through history for the church of God. He says in verse 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Baal? Or what has a believer in common with unbelievers? Jeremiah and Jeremiah were told not to learn the way of the heathen. In Exodus 23, the Israelites were warned not, warned not to even mention the name of other gods. This is how seriously God took the threat of pagan customs encroaching upon his holy days, which is exactly what Easter does. The others don't do so as much. Easter immediately attacks Passover and the days of unleavened bread. When we began, we looked at the story of Moses coming down from the mountain to see the people worshiping a golden calf. This after all the miracles performed by God, God spoke to them directly. We ask, how could this possibly have happened? So I ask you, what about us? We've been given so much more than they have. While they saw and observed the physical manifestations of God's miracles, 
We, on the other hand, have been given the very power of God through his Holy Spirit, which resides in us. I ask you, how far should we stay away from the rebellion against God and the evil represented by these Christian days, or as they have become in our present world, and makes them even that much more dangerous, harmless holidays? When you're faced saying, is this God's will or not God's will, you can draw a clean line. For our young people, my grandchildren, those coming up, these are going to be harmless holidays, and they have really become. They're not religious days, but they are. We saw that. As we approach these days and the snares they can lay before us, let us keep in mind in our hearts what is written in Isaiah 43, verse 10. God says, you are my witnesses and my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Yes, we are God's witnesses, or as we would put it in our uh, church speak, ambassadors, that is representatives, and as such we must stand in the gap and not get anywhere near these golden calves, as Aaron did, who knew better, but participated at some level with the Israelites in the making and the worship of that golden calf. As we approach these days and their celebrations, which as we saw are rooted in pagan worship of foreign gods, which our God, the true God, forbids his people to be associated with, we must keep in mind what God told Moses concerning the worship of the golden calf. When the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sins. God takes this very seriously. And as his ambassadors, we must recognize what these days are and from whom they come. And we must not get anywhere close to them in any way, any form, or any fashion. 